Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Back in 1 Samuel, we're picking up chapter 25, verse 1 tonight. In this study, we're going to have an incredible lesson on how you have to control your temper. And make note of Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. It says, A man who can't control his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And then Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29, it says, He that is slow to anger is of good understanding, but he that is hasty in spirit exalteth folly. So we're going to have such an incredible lesson in this chapter. Remember, in our last study, um, David was overcoming evil with good. He spared Saul's life, and that chapter is going to be a perfect segue straight into this chapter. Going to have some similar things, but some other great lessons that we're going to learn that just teaches you how to be even in just everyday life. There's so much wisdom in the book of Samuel all throughout the Word of God. There's so much wisdom, of course. So let's get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for your written word in this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. So, all right, we pick it up. 1 Samuel chapter 25. Verse 1, and it reads, And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together, and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Samuel, who was a judge, who was an incredibly righteous man, you see in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1, where certain people were just going completely away from God. And God said, um, even if Moses and Samuel uh, pled to me for these people, my heart still couldn't be toward this people. So that tells how much wickedness those were partaking in. But that also shows you how much of an incredible intercessor that Samuel was. God chose to put him there on that same line with Moses. And remember back in chapter 12, verse 4, when Samuel was saying, have I done anything wrong to you? Have I taken any bribes or anything? The answer was, of course not. The people said even to Samuel, you have not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, nor taken aught of any, of any man's hand. I mean, so Samuel was righteous, a true servant of God. We learned back in chapter 1 that his mother Hannah dedicated him as a servant of the Lord even before he was ever conceived. Samuel was a very righteous man, and of course, you know from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, when your flesh body dies, it returns to the dirt, and the Spirit returns to the Father. And Samuel is with our Heavenly Father even today, as he will be for all eternity. And um, the wilderness of Paran, make note of Numbers chapter 10, verse 12, where it speaks of how the, the children of Israel took journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And remember, the God utilized that cloud that when the cloud would stop over a certain place, it was time for the Israelites to stop and make camp. But then when that cloud moved, it was time for the Israelites to move. So Samuel returned to the Father. Everyone was mourning, gathered together. But of course, remember, it's also time to rejoice because Samuel's with the Father. Okay, verse 2. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. Churlish means he was cruel. But Abigail, she was of good understanding. And remember Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And we do, we revere the Lord. The only time you would have to fear God is if you're going against Him. But to revere Him, that means you love Him, you serve Him. And it also means that you know you better fear Him if you want to go against Him. 
but God is always with you. He gives you comfort. He gives you peace. He gives you happiness. That's impossible without him. And so, so this guy, uh, Nabal, he's rich. Now, check out the word Nabal in your Sean's Concordance. It, it means foolish. And we're going to see that he is quite foolish. We're going to see it straight from the Word of God. And remember 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, where it says, The love of money is the root of all evil. Of course, it's a blessing to be blessed by God when you work hard. You get blessed. You're successful. But to love money, to covet money, to put money above God is an incredible sin. And uh, so Nabal had money, but he, he doesn't do things God's way. And you see in that 1 Timothy 6.10 that, that uh, riches drive you into many bad things. Verse 4, And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And once again, he's living in prosperity. But remember what it said to the church in Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2. I know that you're poor, but you're rich. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, but wisdom is more valuable than anything. To have, to have true knowledge, understanding of God's word, that's true riches. But once again, that 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, don't forget that. Verse 6, or we got that, verse 7. And now I have heard that thou hast shears, and now thy shepherds which are with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. And so David and those that were with him, he, he was helping the people that were with Nabal out, help protecting the sheep and making sure that robbers wouldn't come and steal their stuff or anything like that. So David sending this message to Nabal, me and my people, we took care of you guys well. Verse 8, Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes. So David's saying, you ask your men to know I'm not just lying. And then David's saying, the young men that are with me, let them find favor in your eyes. For we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. I mean, that, that's the least Nabal could do, right? And remember, David's on the run from Saul. Even though Saul acted like um, a, a chapter ago that everything was just fine, well, it, we're going to see it's obviously not. Even toward the end of this chapter, we're going to see that. But um, So it would have obviously been the right thing for Nabal to help out. And don't ever forget Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27 through 28. It says, Withhold not good from them to, it, to, withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. So if someone comes to you and asks you for help, you help them out. Of course, if, if it's written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if a man won't work, neither should he eat. So you don't enable people. But people who are trying, if they come to you to help, you help them out. And it even says in that verse in Proverbs, it says, don't wait till tomorrow. Don't say, oh, just come back later. No, if you have it by you, you help them out. But Nabal is not going to do that at all. Verse 9. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. So they're telling Nabal what David said, the message. Verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? The son of Jesse, that's David. Nabal is basically saying, I don't, I don't care who's, who's David. I'm not going to do anything for him, is basically what he's saying. There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. And he's saying that because David is on the run from Saul. But David didn't do anything wrong for that to happen. Saul is just doing everything he can to try to murder David. David had no choice but to flee, but he's sure not doing it because he's a criminal or anything like that. Verse 11, Nabal continues, Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? I, 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 my, my, my. Not giving any credit to God. 
saying, should I give what I have and give it to these people? I don't even know who they are. You remember in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 8, it talks about how when you're blessed, make sure you don't forget it's God who gave you those blessings. But we see the pride in Nabal, and pride was even Satan's downfall in the first earth age, Ezekiel 28, verse 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. 13, And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men, and 200 abode by the stuff. So he held 200 back to protect the stuff. But David, he's, say, he's saying, let's go, let's go kill them all. That, that's what David's plan is, as we're going about to see. But that is not good at all. We just learned in the last chapter how, and we even went and we read in Romans chapter 12, you don't take vengeance on yourself. God says, I'm the one who will repay. God says, I will take the vengeance. But you do not take vengeance on yourself. So David, he's letting his temper flare up here. Let's go kill them all. But that would be a very wicked thing to do. Let's go to the next verse. Verse, uh, verse 13. Or no, we got that. Verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on him. You remember how Christ reacted when people were reviling him in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23? It says he didn't revile back, but he just put his trust in the Heavenly Father, and that's what we do. Once again, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the last verse of Romans chapter 12, verse 15. But the men were very good unto us. They're talking about David's men, how they took care of him before. And we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. And Nabal, he won't listen to reason, he's a son of Belial. Belial means uh, worthless or, or wicked. But you check it out when you see Belial in the New Testament in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, it's either chapter 5 or 6. You look up that in your Strong's Concordance, it will tell you that's an epithet of Satan. And it truly is. It says there, what, what communion or what concord hath Christ with Belial? There is none. So you find, you see here how wicked Belial, or how wicked Nabal truly is, and it's no secret to anybody. Even their own, uh, even his own wife is going to say that later. And saying he, he won't listen to anything. So this young man's going to Abigail, his wife, Nabal's wife, and we're going to see God use her in an incredible way. Remember, she ha we're going to see that she has incredible wisdom. And once again, God is going to use her, and God does use women in incredible ways. And now, noting how Nabal, they knew Nabal wasn't going to listen to reason. Make note of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 32, which says, He that, refu he that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. So don't ever think you're so wise that you can't learn from anybody else. We're going to see David is even going to learn from Abigail. Verse 18. Then Abigail made haste. That, that might remind you of Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24, which she kept making haste. I mean, she, she was ready to, to do things, not just sitting around, being lazy, taking sweet time. No, when it's time to do something, you do it. So Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. That's going to be a, a good amount that can help out David. And n notice how God is even using Abigail even to provide for David. God doing multiple things at once here. And to, to make all righteousness to, for everything to be done his way. Verse 19. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me, 
Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. She knew he wasn't going to listen to anything. You might think of Micah chapter 7, verse 5, where it's, it's just switched around, where it says, um, the, d don't even uh, keep your mouth even for her that lieth in your bosom. And it goes on to tell you how d your enemies are going to be the members of your own house. Well, when's that going to happen? When Satan is here as the false Christ and your family members who were never taught the word of God, they're going to think that he is Christ. And then so you better be real careful what you say at all times. Verse, uh, verse 20. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. 21. Now David had said, so this is what was already what David was already thinking, what he was already planning. Now David had said, Surely in vain we surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him. And he hath requited me evil for good. Saying, Well, we just helped this guy out for nothing. And I, I do want to mention that you don't help people for rewards, you know, that's not what you do it for. You do it because it's the right thing to do. But, but you can, I mean, David, it's understandable he's upset that Nabal is not going to help him out at all after David did so much for him. And remember how we talked about Luke chapter 6, about verse 26 through 38, how um, even, even sinners do good to those who are good to them. But we're supposed to be good to our enemies, and hopefully that can even convert them, even bring them to Jesus Christ. Verse 22. So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by morning light, any that pisseth against the wall, that means any males. So what David is saying that um, if I do not kill every single male that pertains to Nabal, then let my enemies be, be super blessed and taken care of. So David's basically vowing that he's going to, he, he's not vowing to God. He, he didn't do that, but he, he's got it in his mindset that he's going to kill every last man that per, pertains to Nabal. Once again, that, that's a, that would be a terribly wicked thing to do. 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted. Once again, she's not wasting time. She knows time's of the essence here. And lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. And fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. She's going to use... Very soft, very kind words. And remember Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, it says, um, uh, Grievous or hurtful words stirreth up wrath. But uh, kind words is the, the, I can't remember exactly how it words it, but kind words is the way to go. That's how you can even change an enemy's mind. And uh, notice how she's, she's saying, remember, she didn't have any iniquity concerning this. But she's basically saying, let, let Nabal's iniquity come on me. And don't ever forget that Jesus Christ, he who had no sin, he paid that price on the cross for our sins. And by his stripes, we are healed, like you see in Isaiah chapter 53, about verse 4. Verse 25. Let not my Lord, the small L, she's talking about David, saying, Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. Even his own, Nabal's own wife's calling him a man of Belial. Saying, Don't regard him, David. For as his name is, so is he. Once again, uh, Nabal means foolish, and that's exactly how he acts. And remember, uh, that Belial, you see it in the New Testament. I might have quoted the wrong scripture before. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is where that scripture is at, Belial in the New Testament. So continuing verse 25, Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, so she's saying, now David, as now my Lord David, as God liveth, as the Lord Yahweh liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord, seeing God hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood, and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Let, let all of your enemies be foolish. 
We're gonna, when we see get to Absalom's rebellion in 2 Samuel chapter about 14 through 18, we're going to see how Ahithophel, um, how they're going to be asking that Ahithophel, that his counsel be turned to foolishness. That, the, that Absalom, the wicked one who rebels, that he listen to foolish counsel. And that's what they'll be asking for. And of course, the, the usurper Absalom, he's going to get taken down. But so, so she, notice how she's given credit to Almighty God. She's saying that the Lord Yahweh hath withholding you, have withhold you from shedding blood. She's basically saying, God sent me to you, but she's not doing it in a prideful way at all. You might see some people, oh, God sent me to do this. That's not how she's acting at all. But she's just making sure David knows that it was God that has made sure, David, that you don't commit this wicked sin. That you don't kill all these innocent people. And God will, he will protect you, but you have to listen. David could just be like, oh no, I'm going to kill them all anyway. And of course then God will let you fall if you want to refuse instruction. But David is going to listen. Praise God for that. And don't forget it's God who's doing this. That's keeping David from committing that sin. Once again, David's still got to listen. He's got to follow through. Verse 27. And now this blessing which thine hand made hath brought unto my Lord, speaking about David, let it be even given unto the young men that follow my Lord. All the, all the raisin cakes and all the fig cakes and clusters of raisins and all that she brought. She's saying, David, give this to your men. And once again, another blessing from God utilizing this woman, Abigail. Verse 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid. Once again, she didn't even really have a trespass in this matter at all. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. He's saying God is going to make David a true house. A sure house. Because my Lord, because David fighteth the battles of the Lord. David fighteth the battles of God. And e evil hath not been found in all thy ways. Now this is very interesting because this is prophecy. And we're, when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 7, we're going to see that David's going to have this, this real nice house of cedar. But he's going to say, but, but God, he just dwells in the tent with curtains. And then David, he wants to go and build God a house. But God tells David that I didn't ask you to build me a house. And then God lets David know that it's going to be through your offspring that, uh, that the, the, the throne and the kingdom will be established forever. And that was even referring to Solomon, David's son. But the, the true, the great prophecy of that is that through the offspring of David would be born our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The true King of kings and Lord of lords who will sit on that throne and he will reign forever and ever. And you can see how clearly that prophecy is given to you in Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. If you have any doubt that that 2 Samuel 7 is prophecy of Jesus Christ, that Luke chapter 1 will make that very clear to you. So she's, she is prophesying even about Jesus Christ here. How awesome is that, how God's using her in this way. Verse 29. Yet a man is risen to pursue thee. Talking about Saul, of course. Saul is trying to kill David every chance he gets, basically. And to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. She's saying, David, you're going to be bound up and you're protected is what she's saying. And when you trust in God, you truly are protected. And the souls of thine enemies shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. So you're, you're protected, David, by our Heavenly Father, but your enemies, they're going to be slung out. They're going to be out in this world without God's protection. That's a terrible spot to be in. Of course, you can't help but think about how David even used that sling to smoke Goliath and to kill Goliath the giant back in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 30. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord, when God does to David, according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. Uh, verse 31. That, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged the himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, when God shall have dealt well with David, 
than remember thine handmaid. Now, th this is so awesome. She's saying, David, when you end up being king and you have the kingdom, you remember that God kept you brat back from committing that terrible sin. And th that's how it is, you know. I mean, if you do something wicked to, to exalt yourself to a position or something like that, you, you don't enjoy it. You know that you got it by the way of wickedness. You can't enjoy it at all. But she's saying, remember that God kept you back from committing that wicked sin, from murdering all those people. To where then when you're king, you'd have to, that'd have to be in your mind. You'd have to know that you did that. But God kept David back from it. And don't ever forget to thank God when he does keep you back from, from committing sins. And it's so interesting how she says, Remember thine handmaid. Do you remember in Luke 23 when Jesus Christ is being crucified and there's a malefactor being crucified on both sides of him? One of them just kept railing and just kept uh, slandering and mocking Jesus Christ. But the other one, he, he converted. And you remember what he said to Jesus Christ? He said, Lord, remember me when I come into thy kingdom. And Jesus Christ said to him, This day... Will you be with me in paradise? So, of course, that the malefactor, his soul is not in the ground. Neither is anybody's soul in the ground. But no, they're in paradise with our Heavenly Father on one side of the gulf or the other, like you see in Luke chapter 16. But just like that malefactor asked the Lord to remember her or to remember him, this Abigail is asking David, the one who through David would come, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, through his offspring. She's asking this David to remember her. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. How, how awesome. Always giving, They're giving God the credit, as we always have to. Verse 33. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Once again, you leave the vengeance in God's hands. Now, never forget, your whole life can change in one second. You let anger just completely control, overcome you. Remember, you can't control your own spirit. You're like a city with broken down without walls. And someone's coming at you or whatever, just saying something to you or something, and you let anger take over you. You kill them on accident or something, or you, I mean, your life can change in one second when you might be a good person, but you let that anger take over you and you, you accidentally kill someone or you hurt someone real bad. Now, now you're going to prison for 25 years or for your life or something. Your whole life can change in one second. Control your emotions. Control your anger. Don't ever, and God's word gives you wisdom over and over about that, how it's a, it's a foolish thing to not be able to control your anger. Get it under control. Turn to God. In a, in a situation, someone, something's happening, be praying to your heavenly father in, in silence, in, in your head. He hears your thoughts. Just please help me to overcome this. Please help me to do this your way. And God will. Don't fly off the handle. Remain calm. Set the example as a Christian. Verse 34. And I have to mention also Luke chapter 18, that parable of the unjust judge, where the woman, she kept going to the unjust judge and saying, avenge me of my adversary. The unjust judge, he didn't care about God. He didn't care about her. But because she just kept asking, he took care of her. And then so you, then you go on to see in that, how, how much more will God, will God avenge his elect who cry to him night and day? And so God will avenge you, so you just leave it in his hands. That Luke 18 is awesome. Verse 34, For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which has kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. I would have killed every last one of them, every last male there. But David's saying, praise God that he sent you to me and kept me back from that sin. And that truly is something to praise God about. And we mentioned it recently in a study or two ago, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, where it says, Exhort one another daily 
while it is yet called today, so, so that they do not be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And to exhort, that means to encourage someone. It can also mean to reprove someone, to tell someone, hey, if you keep going in the way of wickedness, it's going to be terrible for you. So if you feel led to do something, you don't say, oh, well, I'll wait a while. You know, No, you do it today if you feel like someone needs that help. If she would have waited a day, hundreds probably, a whole bunch for sure of men would have got murdered. But she did it right then. Not only did their lives get saved, but David got protected from committing a terrible sin. Don't wait around. You haste just like she did. And I wanted to mention James chapter 5, verse 19 through 20, where it says, If you convert someone, you save a soul from death, and you hide a multitude of sins. And of course, it's always God that does it. And I wanted to mention along with that, you can read on your own, Jude chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. Verse 35. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, all the, the figs and raisins and all that, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. And praise God, David, listen. Once again, don't ever think you can't learn from somebody else. David didn't say, oh, I'm about to be the next king. Now, now this woman who I don't even know is coming to me. I'm not going to listen to her. That, that, David could have done that. Look how bad it would have been. No, God will put people in your path. He'll put people in your life. And remember, a fool despises instruction. Of course, you always want to have spiritual discernment. If what someone's telling you is completely against what God says to do, of course, you don't listen to it. But she brought true wisdom here, and David listened and praised God. A whole lot of lives got saved for it. And remember Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What a peacemaker Abigail was here. Verse 36. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. She would have told him right then in a drunken rage he might have killed her or something like that. Remember Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7. There's a time, there's a time to rend and a time to sow. There's a time to be silent and a time to speak. Here it was a time to be silent and make note of Amos chapter 5 verse 13 also. So once again, you ask God for the guidance to know how to handle situations. And he will lead you if you're trying the best to serve him. If you diligently study your word so you have his word sealed in your mind. And uh, remember Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker. And whoever therefore is whoever thereby is deceived by it is not wise. It can destroy you. Verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that, that the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. So that tells you how big of a sin it was that Nabal wouldn't help David. Some people might say, well, well, all he did is he just didn't help David. Yeah, that's a great sin. You remember Matthew 25 when Christ says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate the sheep from the goats. And he speaks to some where he says how you've taken care of me when I was sick and when I was in prison and when I was hungry, you took care of me through all that. And they say to Christ, Christ, when did we do that? And then he says, inasmuch as you have done it into, into any other one of these little ones, is that it's like you did it to me. So when you help someone who needs help, it's like you are helping Jesus Christ. But then he, he takes it to the other side. He speaks to the others who didn't help other people when they needed it. And he says, just like you've denied them, it's like you've denied me. So yeah, it's a terrible sin to not help someone when they need help, when they're trying. Verse 39. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. Once again, he's praising God. Thank you, God, that you kept me back from murdering all those innocent people. 
For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. Just like we read last night in Romans chapter 12 where it says, If, you're, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. That's exactly what happened here. And it, it was a death sentence for Nabal. God saw it right to struck him dead, to strike him dead. But we talked about how those coals of fire, how that can hopefully, when you're good to your enemies, that will get their attention. And they will realize that they shouldn't be treating you bad. And what our main thing we could hope for is that that can convert them to Christianity by you setting that incredible example, by you showing kindness and peace when almost anyone would curse them back and all that. But when you show that kindness and that way of a Christian, that can convert people. Um, continuing verse 39, or, or yeah, continuing 39. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. So once again, David's getting super blessed here. Verse 40. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they came unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And Abigail hasted, there she is, hasting, not wasting time, not being lazy. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David, and she became his wife. How incredible was it how God used Abigail in this chapter. God uses women just as much as He uses men. We're all children of God. How much did God use her here? And um, make note of Psalms 31 where it will tell you uh, the, the price of a virtuous woman is far above rubies, meaning a virtuous woman's way more valuable than rubies, which are incredibly valuable, of course. But it, it tells you the characteristics of a virtuous woman in that Proverbs 31. How if it's like it says, um, if a man find, finds a wife, he findeth a good thing, and you are super, super blessed if you have that. Have a, of a spouse, whether you're a man or a woman, whatever. If you have a spouse, you have a marriage where you truly both love each other. You are so blessed. Don't ever forget to thank God for that. Verse forty-three. David also took a Hinoam of Jezreel. And they, were, and they were also both of them his wives. We'll see when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 3 that um, Amnon will be a child born to, um, to, to David of Ohinoam. And uh, he will have a, a son through Abigail by the name of uh, Caleb. But he's also, at some time, he's called Daniel. Of course, not the Daniel of the book of Daniel, though. Verse 44 to complete. But Saul had given Michal his daughter, David's wife, to Faulty, the son of Laish, which was of Galim. Now, of course, that's an incredibly wicked thing to do. And remember last chapter, Saul was basically saying, Oh, yeah, David, everything's just fine with us, you know. Once again, it's obvious that it's not. Don't worry, when, when we get to 2 Samuel chapter 3, David's going to call for Michal to come back to him. But in this chapter, don't ever forget, in the last chapter we talked about it a great deal, let God take the vengeance. Like it says in Psalm chapter 105, verse 15, God says, Touch not mine anointed. And, and he, it says there, Do my prophets no harm. David was a prophet. That's proven in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 30. But those who truly love God, those who serve Him, remember, you're protected. Just like I said, you're bound up. You're protected. Your enemies are slaying out like a sling. that They don't have a chance against you because they're not protected. But you are. So when someone comes against you, someone tries to do something to you, someone mocks you, whatever they might try to do, remember Christ's example in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Don't mock them back. Don't revile them back. You just put your trust in our Heavenly Father, and you let God take the vengeance, and He will. Make no mistake about that. You, you leave it in God's hands, God will take the vengeance. And always remember to praise God for Him interceding in your life to keep you back from sin. 
when you could have done something that would have destroyed your whole life. But God interceded. He made sure that you didn't commit that sin. And in, in your life, guarantee that's probably happened at least once or twice. And so you remember to thank God for that. Praise Him for always being with us. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your Word and this place You've given us. We can teach Your Word. We thank You for teaching us how to act in all types of situations, for giving us the wisdom to, so our lives aren't destroyed like they could be in, in one second if we were to let it. We thank You for helping us to not commit those type of sins, and we thank You for wisdom. And we thank You for when we do sin, that when we truly repent, You wash those sins away. We know that's possible because You sent Your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to pay that price on the cross for us and to resurrect for us. We thank you so much, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.